Jen and Cam are two funny ladies who like to talk about murder, mass murder, murder suicide, serial killers, spree killers, thrill killers, contract killings, honor killings, and a whole lot of other shit. Too heinous for me to list here. If you're disturbed by this sort of content, you may want to listen to something else. And if you're a child trying to listen to our true crime podcast, well, you better ask your mama. <laughs> Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Ooh. I'm excited to hear it. I know. We're getting down to the end of the year, and I think I we have, um, not including this one, there's three more episodes until we start what? 12 Nightmares Before Christmas. Yes, that's. And on December 2nd, we will be in Atlanta. With Hot all Lena. of our friends, yes. We need Hot to figure Lena. out where where it's going to be, right? Yeah. I, mm. We'll be posting information on, about that soon, so. Till then, oh, yep. I heard you hit a case today. Yep, we do. Are you ready for it? I'm so ready. Let's go. All right. St. Charles, Missouri, right down the road here. St. Charles, Missouri has the luxury of being both a suburb of St. Louis and its own independent city. Nestled on the Missouri River, it was founded by French Canadians in 1769. And while the city has sprawled way beyond its original borders with new shopping centers and subdivisions popping up, this historic district, with its cobblestone streets and numerous festivals throughout the year, is what the town is most known for. That and the fact that Lewis and Clark set off on their big adventure from St. Charles in 1804. And for those of you that aren't familiar with American history, that was the Lewis and Clark Expedition, which is also known as the Corps of Discovery Expedition. And this was an expedition to cross the newly acquired western portion of the U.S. after the Louisiana Purchase. And, Look at you. Well, that was thanks to Wiki. That wasn't just on my own words. That was okay. Wiki words. Yeah. I'm just impressed with you. Well, I knew what it was, but to actually put you it in a history words. lesson. It's yeah. pretty good. There you go. Now, most residents of Missouri know that Missouri doesn't usually have too many perfect weather days. In the spring, there are, tor- there are tornadoes. And in the summer, it's too hot and too humid to do anything. And you run the risk of really being carried off by mosquitoes. They're horrible around these parts. And in the winter, it's damp and cold. But July 25th, 1980, it was a picture-perfect Missouri summer day in St. Charles. Blue skies, low humidity, low humidity, and warm temperatures. And so on this perfect day, 18-year-old Mary Michelle Fleming, known to everybody as Mickey, decided to head to the old Hedges and Hafer grocery store just around the corner from her apartment on Yale Boulevard. Mickey was the youngest of eight children and had just graduated high school. She had lived in the apartment with her mother, who had just left for work that day at 6.30 a.m., and she also lived with one of her sisters, who had also left for work, but that time around a half an hour later at 7 a.m. Then a little while after that, Mickey straightened up her long blonde hair, threw on a bikini top and a pair of denim shorts, and walked to the grocery store. She cashed a check and bought items to make a salad. After she checked out, she stopped and talked to a friend for a little bit before heading back home. Her vibrant young life would violently end in less than 15 minutes. Hmm. At 11 a.m., Dale Presser and her husband, Robert, looked out the window and saw a young woman running towards their apartment. She had long blonde hair, and she was covered in blood. Hmm. She was also naked from the waist down with her bikini top pulled up over her breasts. Robert said to his wife, quote, if she's running like that, someone's chasing her. As the girl knocked on the door, Robert swung it open. Help me, the girl muttered and then collapsed on the porch. The couple called 911 and Robert covered the girl with a sheet. Police and rescue showed up within minutes. The ambulance whisked the girl off to the hospital while police followed the blood trail across the road to the back door of the apartment on Yale. They had found the scene of the crime and had identified the victim as Mary Michelle Mickey Fleming. 
Inside the apartment, the police found eggs boiling on the stove and a bowl where Mickey had started to prepare her salad for lunch. In the front living room lay a pair of jean shorts on the floor. Blood and hair were stuck to the walls, and there was blood found in, on both of the end tables and the coffee table. There was also a very large puddle of blood in the middle of the living room floor. An unopened and blood-spattered purse containing money was found on the coffee table. A trail of blood was in the hallway between the living room and the kitchen, and a pair of women's underwear spotted with blood was on the kitchen floor. There was a bloody handprint on the back door, and blood had pooled on the porch. To say that the apartment was blood-soaked is like, hello, Captain Obvious, you know? I mean, it was mm -hmm. quite the scene. To the investigators, the scattered clothing made the violent and panic struggle all too real. Mickey fought her assailant every second of the way, and seconds were all she had. Despite all valiant attempts by the ER doctors and nurses, Mary Michelle Fleming, known as an incredibly smart, spirited, good person, was pronounced dead at the local hospital. Later, a coroner would state that she had been stabbed in the lung and stabbed in the heart. The stab wound to the heart pierced the heart completely, and a piece of metal lodged into her lung. Her forehead and arms were bruised, and she had numerous defense wounds, but the wound that most likely killed her was the one-inch deep, eight-inch long slash on her throat. The fact that she was able to get up at all, let alone run across the street, is a testament to her strength and sheer will to live. Paula Zahn covered this case, and in one of the interviews with Mickey's brothers, Brian, said that she found out what was happening when he called the house and the police answered. <laughs> hmm. And they're like, who is this? And they're like, this is the police. Can you get in touch with your mother now? Yeah. I mean, it was, can you believe? Like your no. stomach would just drop expecting no. to awful. your sister to answer, your mother to answer, and then the police actually answer telling you what happened. It would be horrible. Mm -mm. An autopsy could not determine whether she had been raped or sexually assaulted, but as one of the St. Charles investigators said, quote, you don't need to take a person's clothes off to kill them. They strongly felt as though the crime had been sexually motivated and why her attacker did not follow through with the rape and fled the scene is unknown, but it could have been because of a phone call. At 11 a.m. during the attack, one of Mickey's friends called her apartment and she said that a man answered the phone, a man whose voice she didn't recognize. The friend asked if she could speak to Mickey and he responded that she wasn't home and asked who was calling. The woman responded, Ellie. The unidentified male said that he would have Mickey call her back. Immediately afterward, the friend found the whole situation, quote, kind of weird. And thinking maybe she had the wrong number, she called back. And that time, there was no answer. Mickey had run out the back door and her attacker. Nope. When he was on the phone? Mickey had run out the back door and her attacker out the front door. When he was on the phone? Is that this, how she made her escape? That I don't know. She, he had oh. called... And the second time she called, Mickey had run. Oh, okay. And the attacker ran out the back. The newspaper would later publicize that the bloody handprint was found on the back of the door, giving away clues. There had been a few rape cases in the area at the time, and at first police thought they might be connected to the murder of Mickey Fleming. Mickey also told some friends and family members that she had been getting prank phone calls around this time. This caller didn't identify himself, but he said inappropriate things and at one point even mentioned that he knew her bra size. She was worried enough that one of her friends actually bought her some mace to protect herself. When investigators questioned friends and family, they reported that Mickey thought it was maybe one of her ex-boyfriends, which is usually the case, right? That's mm -hmm. likely. At first, investigators thought that they had their man since the individual in question was obsessed with weapons and owned a few knives. And his reaction upon being told Mickey's murder, you know what it was? They said, hey, your ex-girlfriend died. And he said, oh, really? <laughs> That's it? That's it. Oh, really? But it was soon determined that he had been at work at the time of the assault. So they, ru they ruled him out as her killer. You would think even if you hated the person, you'd find something different to say than, oh, really? Oh. You'd think. Oh. Yeah. I thought you were going to say, which one? That's what I thought was coming. <laughs> that one's worse. Then a witness came forward. She had been at Hedges and Hafer grocery store at 11 a.m. when she saw a man come running from the direction of Mickey's apartment complex on Yale. She described him as clean-shaven, with shoulder-length hair, wearing light-color clothing. 
And more importantly, he had gotten into a cream-colored convertible with the top down and sped away. Mm. Police had speculated that if Mickey had not had the wherewithal to make it to her neighbor's house, and instead she died in her apartment and not been discovered until her mother came home, that it would have made this case so much harder to solve. But because they had the exact time of the attack, they were able to match that up with the time of the woman in the parking lot and determined that the woman had most likely witnessed Mickey's murderer flee the scene. Hmm. And now they had a very detailed description of the car used in the getaway. So police immediately began looking for a cream-colored convertible. Then another break in the case. An auto body shop reported that the owner of a cream-colored convertible had requested to have his car painted on that day, and he didn't care what color it was. He didn't (laughs) care. Just paint it. All he needed... It just needed to be done ASAP, as soon as possible. That's not suspect at all. At all, right? Mm -mm. The owner of this car was one Richard Robertson. Now, Richard Robertson at one time had been a petty criminal, but had turned his life around after a stint in jail. He now now had a seven-year-old son and was gainfully employed. So here was Robertson, a man with a criminal past, with a car that matched the description, desperately trying to get it painted as quickly as possible, and yet he didn't match the description of the driver. Robertson told police that a friend of his, a man that he had worked with in Florida that, but was now a resident of Kansas, had been visiting with him. Oh. That man's name was Anthony Joe Lorette, or Tony. So Tony had stayed with him and his family a whole week. He admitted he let Tony use his car the day that Mickey was murdered because Tony needed to go to a job interview. He was also supposed to babysit Robertson's seven-year-old son, but instead, Tony had left him home all alone that day. Hmm. Robertson described to police how, when Tony dropped him off at work that morning, he was wearing a light-colored pant and a shirt. But when he picked Robertson up at 1.15, Tony was wearing a t-shirt and cut-off jeans. Robertson said that he never saw the light-colored pants or shirt again. So, where was his friend now, they asked? Mm-hmm. Well, the day after Mickey's murder, Robertson drove Tony home to Topeka, Kansas. Then two days later, Robertson realized that his vehicle fit the description of the one used in Mickey's murder. So instead of going to police and saying, hey. Yep. Yep. In the meantime, police had found another witness. A 15-year-old girl had been riding her bike around at about 1045 in the morning that Mickey was murdered. She said that a man fitting Anthony Lorette's description and clothing drove past her in a light-colored convertible. And it's important to note that he was alone in the car at the time. She got this very uncomfortable feeling when he circled around her and stared at her the second time. And then uh, she was completely creeped out when he circled back around for a third time, still staring at her. But forever, for whatever reason, he drove away and let her be. So by now, St. Charles investigators really wanted to talk to Anthony Joe Lorette. They had discovered that he had been convicted of rape in the early 1970s in Kansas, but only served two years of a five to 20 year sentence. He had also been in and out of mental health institutions and had been arrested on indecent exposure charges more than once. Lorette had repeated the seventh grade four times before finally quitting school at the age of 17. Wait, what? Seventh grade? Yes. Repeated the seventh grade four times before finally quitting at the age of 17. Hmm. Yeah. When police returned to Richard Robertson's house to search it for any possible evidence that Lorette might have left behind, the phone rang. Robertson's wife answered, cupped her hand over the phone, and told officers that it was Lorette. One of the officers ran upstairs and picked up the second landline to listen into the conversation. That kind of made me laugh because I remember sneaking, yeah, sneaking to on listen the phone. To mm-hmm. when my brother was talking to girls. I'd go listen on the phone. Police listened as Lorette told Robertson not to worry that he'd thrown out the murder weapon, a stiletto type locked blade knife. He threw that into the river. Robertson tore into his friend, exclaiming, She was only 18 years old and she had her whole life ahead of her. And Lorette claimed that he had seen Mickey at the grocery store when she was cashing her check and that he followed her home with the intention of robbing her. But when Mickey began screaming, he struck her and knocked her down. Then he stabbed her and cut her throat as she attempted to run away from him. 
In the phone call, he also said that he would stay away from his parents' home for 30 days until, quote, the heat was off. It's murder, baby. The heat's never off. On August 6th, 1980, St. Charles County investigators found Lorette at his sister's home in Topeka, Kansas, after a flimsy suicide attempt. He'd sliced his own throat and one of his wrists, but they were superficial wounds only requiring stitches. And uh, like a macabre necklace, the hospital tape and stitches can be seen clearly in his mugshot photo. He's kind of like this Frankenstein looking thing. Mm -hmm. On August 7th, 1980, in the Shawnee County Jail, the police read Lorette his rights and had him sign the appropriate paperwork and then ask him about the murder of Mickey Fleming. Lorette, in a dramatic display, placed his hands over his eyes and said, quote, I'm responsible for her death. I can't believe he admitted it. Mm -hmm. The story he spun for investigators went like this. Ah. He had picked up a hitchhiker near Robertson's house, Mm -hmm. and the hitchhiker asked him if he would take him, the hitchhiker, to the house of a girl who owed him some money. Lorette said he drove the hitchhiker to the grocery store parking lot and parked at the edge of the lot next to some apartments. The hitchhiker then got out of the car and went into one of the apartments. And after waiting about 15 minutes, Lorette got worried, worried about the hitchhiker, and went to the apartment's front door and looked inside. Mm -hmm. There he found the hitchhiker standing or bending over a girl, and that girl was covered in blood. Lorette described how the hitchhiker stabbed the girl as she pleaded for her life. Lorette then tried to make himself the hero of the story, claiming Mm -hmm. that he ran in to help her. And as he tried to help, the girl started fighting him. She broke away and ran out the back door. And at this point, he found himself covered in the girl's blood. Terrified that he'd get blamed, he ran out of the apartment, leaving his bloody handprint on the door. Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Sounds totally legit. Lorette was turned. It's those damn hitchhikers. That's why you should never pick them up. It's a bushy-haired stranger like Mm -hmm. last week's episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lorette was returned to St. Charles, where authorities planned to question him about some of the rapes that occurred in the area. They also wanted to question him further about this mysterious hitchhiker. This time, Lorette told the officers that he took the hitchhiker to the girl's apartment, but said that when he went to find the hitchhiker, he saw him either kneeling or laying on the girl and that the hitchhiker's pants were pulled down and his buttocks were exposed. Mm -hmm. When police informed him about witnesses who saw him driving around the convertible alone with no hitchhiker in the car, and that witnesses had only seen Mickey running from the back of the apartment and not another male, he began to cry. The piece of information that cinched his guilt was the bloody handprint on the door that Lorette claimed to belong to him. It wasn't Anthony Joe Lorette's. It belonged to the victim. It was Mickey's handprint. Hmm. When Lorette realized that he'd just put himself at the crime scene covered in Mickey's blood and that none of these witnesses had seen another man with him, he confessed with just three words, quote, I did it. And Lorette actually read about the print in the newspaper. Uh, He didn't know about it till then? No, he read it in the paper. So he knew that there was a print. He just assumed that it was the (laughs) attacker's print. So that's Uh, why he said it was, yeah. Big dummy. Lorette then told the officers he'd entered the Fleming apartment by means of an unlocked rear door, intending to burglarize the home. He first went downstairs and then came back up the stairs and found Mickey standing in her living room and that she had conveniently already removed her shorts. Mm -hmm. He's such a gross man. Lorette, with knife in hand, grabbed her, telling her that he didn't want to hurt her and not to scream. Mickey agreed not to scream and he let her go. However, Mickey broke her promise and began screaming, quote, this is when it happened. She lied to me. She promised me she wouldn't scream. Lorette said she was just, quote, like all the others, my wife and my mother-in-law always lied to me. If she hadn't lied to me, it wouldn't have happened. Wrong. Look at him blaming her. I know. He's fantastic. Lorette claimed that he did not remember what happened after Mickey started screaming, and that he had left by the front door and went to Robertson's car. Even with all that evidence and the fact that the police had overheard him confessing to the murder on the phone with his friend, with his friend Robertson, Anthony Joe Lorette still pleaded innocent at his arrangement. Because they all do. Mm-hmm. In April 1981, while awaiting his trial, 
Lorette conspired with his father, Anthony Lorette Sr., to hire men to kill the guards who would take Anthony Jr. to a hospital after he feigned an illness. The convoluted plan was thwarted when Lorette Sr. offered $400 to a police informant, who then relayed the escape plan to the police department. And both father and son were charged with this conspiracy to murder. What are they thinking? <laughs> um, they're not. They're not thinking well. very well. However, the charges against Lorette Jr. for this particular crime would be dropped once his trial for the Fleming murder was over. Lorette went to trial on August 11th, 1981 for the murder of Mary Michelle Fleming, with his defense still holding on to the hitchhiker story. Mm -hmm. The jury didn't buy it, and not only was Anthony Joe Lorette convicted of killing Mary Michelle Fleming, but with just... But in just 82 minutes, the jury had decided that the penalty was death. Reportedly, when Lorette was found guilty, he smiled. But then when he heard that he got the death penalty, he put his head in his hands. (sighs) Probably cried because, you know, it's okay to take another person's life. But by God, I'm scared when it's mine, right? But the story doesn't end there. Really? It doesn't. Unfortunately, Mickey Fleming was just the tip of the iceberg. No. Detective. Well, I mean, I guess, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Because, yeah. Detective Patricia Jewell from Pinellas County, Florida, was assigned to assist two Missouri investigators working on a double homicide. Detective Jewell gathered the information for them about their sp- suspects who had fled to Pinellas County. Those two Missouri investigators had occasionally spoken to Lorette on death row because he had offered to furnish details about a murder in exchange for a special visit from his parents. They told him about the helpful detective down in Pinellas and how they wished that they could return the favor to her. I can take care of that, Lorette replied. I can clean up a couple of murders for her. Oh. Mm -hmm. So a cautious friendship blossomed between Lorette and Detective Jewell. Lorette confessed to murdering over a dozen women throughout the 1970s in 11 different states. Oh, my God. A serial killer. Thank you very much. Who knew? I've never even heard of this guy. Uh, Me either. He would travel the country by bus looking for work, killing along the way whenever, quote, he was angry or he felt hurt by his wife or one of his girlfriends. Hmm. He assigned himself the moniker the animal. The problem was that while he would remember vivid details about the murder, even down to how the furniture was arranged in the houses, where he dumped the weapons or how he left the body, he rarely knew the victims by name. He simply so he, he didn't follow the news, obviously. No. He was not hmm, interesting. No. He simply dumped the bodies and moved on, never looking back. As a result, only 14 of his victims have been identified and the cases are closed. Most of that knowledge was painstakingly and patiently procured by Detective Jewell. Lorette trusted her. He revealed the information slowly so that she would keep visiting him. And he promised to tell her all the murders he could remember before his execution. So creepy. No thanks. I know. God bless her. I don't know if I could do it. Mm -mm. I I don't think I could stomach it. Mm -mm. True to his word, two weeks before his execution, Jewell visited him one last time, and Lorette told her of the last two murders that he could remember. <sighs> so, Anthony Joe Lorette's victims are as follows. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. On August 20th, 1976, while going under the alias of Mike Watson, Lorette registered in two separate hotels or motels while staying in Marathon, Florida, and the Florida Keys. Lorette broke into the home of 26-year-old Jeanette Wade, who had just returned home from work. 
He confronted Jeanette in the kitchen and stabbed her multiple times before finally cutting her throat. All while Wade's toddler daughter napped nearby. Lorette then left the scene and hitchhiked out of the city. Despite a witness providing a description of the assailant, he was not caught. The case not only rocked the community of Marathon, but it's also the reason Marathon established anti-hitchhiking laws. Wade had been a lifelong resident. Her husband Stanley worked at a local, ba- at a local bank, and her parents owned two golf gas stations. The community could not shake the brutality and tragedy. When Stanley Wade returned home and found Jeanette dead, their two-and-a-half-year-old daughter was sitting next to her mother's body with her Mm. mother's blood on her feet. Lorette had been in Marathon for only two weeks. The name Mike Watson was borrowed from a guard at a mental institution where Lorette had been a patient. Investigators in Florida had finally narrowed down the mysterious stranger in 1982 as Lorette, but he was already on death row in Missouri by then. Jeanette Wade's mother said that just leave him be. She realized that if he was brought up on charges for her daughter's murder, that that would only buy him more time to stay mm-hmm. alive by using his appeals. Mm-hmm. When Lorette confessed, he knew, de- he knew details only the killer would know, and his fingerprints matched the one that was left at the scene. On August 23rd, 1973, just three days after he murdered Jeanette Wade, 52-year-old Betty H. Brunton had gone home for lunch in Pinellas County, Florida. When she didn't return to her job, worried co-workers went to her home on 49th Avenue and found that basically she'd been stabbed to death in her living room. December 7th, 1977, uh, Lorette would be back in his home state of Kansas where he murdered 24-year-old Beverly J. Wortman, a reporter for the Jackson County Centennial Tribune, Centennial Tribune in Blue Springs. She was found in her Manhattan, Kansas apartment with 19 stab wounds to the chest, neck, and lower abdomen. Her throat had been slashed. Authorities said she had been found face up on her bed, fully clothed with her coat and gloves on, as if she was about to leave or she had just come home. So he just pounces on them. Mm. On May 28, 1978, Lorette was back in Florida. This time, his victim was 60-year-old Helen Alderson Hall. Her family were big, influential Greyhound owners and racers since 1925. Helen's son had returned home from an overnight stay with friends and found his mother's bludgeoned and bloodied body at 6.30 a.m. Her car had been stolen and was found a week later at a hotel parking lot in Tampa, Florida. Even though investigators said there was quite a bit of evidence left in the car, no connection to her killer could be made until Lorette confessed. On the 2nd of November, 1978, Lorette raped and murdered 26-year-old Tracy Gladys Miller, the wife of Paul Miller, a municipal judge. He picks people that are, I don't know, a little connected. Tracy was originally from St. Louis and had graduated from Parkway Central High School. When she didn't show up for her lunch appointment with the wives of fellow attorneys, a secretary was sent to check on her. Again, as in with the Wade case, Tracy's infant daughter, 16-month-old Emily, was found in the house unharmed. Tracy had been stabbed 16 times and her throat slashed. Now, there are 10 additional murders that Lorette confessed to, but their identities have never been revealed. And he, he doesn't know their names, right? He doesn't right? know their so names. So he can't. He just he can't say anything. Does he know location, though? Or did he, I guess? Well, let me tell you. Lorette provided details about other murders as well. However, he could not remember names and sometimes could not remember the exact locations. So they remain open and unsolved, including, are you ready? Mm-hmm. Might want to take notes here. Okay. Two in Biloxi, Mississippi. One on a highway between Maryland and Virginia somewhere. All right. One somewhere in Illinois. One in Dallas, Houston, mm. Omaha, Kansas City, and Independence, Missouri, Denver, a few more in Florida. There's eight in Kansas and three in Louisiana. Oh, my God. Investigators believe that he could be responsible for as many as 30 murders and 50 rapes. You know, and that's just what he's saying. There could be way, way more. Way more. And you don't know. And he only was caught because of two witnesses. Otherwise, he probably would have gotten away with this one, too. Well, because with of Mickey's the, death. Mm-hmm. Because there was witnesses to Mickey's death, he was caught. And the whole friend calling in and saying, I need my cream-colored convertible car colored, any color, Mm -hmm. ASAP. Yeah. But that's three people that, yeah, that 
if it wasn't for them, if it weren't Mm -hmm. for them, he probably would have gone on. It's scary is what it is. No, it's really scary. And those are just the, you know, you're being randomly attacked by somebody you don't even know. Who just show up in your house. That's why once you go into your house, you lock the door immediately. And it bugs me because I, my daughters never do that. I'm like, once you come in the house, you lock the door. That's it. Same with the car. You get in the car, you lock the door. All right. But anyway, back to this. In 1972, Lorette was arrested for pickpocketing and was sentenced to serve one to four years in the Kansas Department of Corrections. In 1974, Lorette was arrested for rape and burglary and was sentenced to five to 20 years, but he only served two of those years. In 1976, Lorette was sentenced to serve six months on a bond default in the custody of the United States Attorney General. The original charges were dismissed. In 1978, Lorette was arrested in Topeka, Kansas, and was sentenced to one to 10 years in the Kansas Department of Corrections. Of course, the sentence was suspended, and Lorette was placed on five years probation. Time and time again, Anthony Anthony Lorette was caught and sentenced and let go. If he had served any of his sentences to full term, he had not been on the streets to kill most of his victims, and... He definitely would have been out driving in the convertible on that perfect July day when Mickey Fleming decided to go to the grocery store. He was diagnosed as a child with learning difficulties and developed abnormal behavior, including auditory hallucinations. At age nine, Lorette first exhibited assertive behavior and attacked a female family friend. Diagnosed then as suffering from psychomotor epilepsy or temporal lobe epilepsy, Lorette was placed on a course of drugs. But his outbursts of aggressive behavior, which were often of a sexual nature, continued. During this time, Lorette spent at least two years in a mental hospital. In 1968, Lorette joined the Army, but was discharged because of his mental illness. He spent most of the following years either in mental institutions or in prison. In 1977, he left the mental institution against doctor's orders and stopped taking his medication, which is never a good idea. Records show that over a span of 30 years, eight different institutions diagnosed and treated Lorette for temporal lobe epilepsy. This condition resulted in him having seizures that caused him to go into a rage, foam at the mouth, and voluntarily urinate, rip off his clothes, and black out. At various times in his life, these seizures occurred between one and three times a week. It was difficult to find medication to treat Lorette because of other medical conditions he had. The jury heard none of his mental health history at the trial. In 1995, Anthony Joe Lorette was executed by lethal injection on November 29th. At his execution was Dennis Fleming, the brother of Mickey Fleming. He felt as though he needed to be there representing his sister. As they pushed the lethal cocktail into his IV, Lorette looked to the right, smiled at the two people that he asked to witness. They've not been identified and apologized to his family. What state was he executed in? Do you know? Missouri, because he was tried in Missouri. The devastating impact on Mary Michelle Mickey Fleming's family was huge, as it was or is on all victims' families. Mickey's mother died within four years of her daughter's murder, having been left a shell of a person. She was never the same and never fully recovered. Mickey was the baby of the family and everybody's bundle of joy. Brian Fleming, another one of Mickey's brothers, said that his sister's death was the end of the family. All holiday gatherings ceased to happen. Dennis Fleming would go on to write a memoir about his sister, Mickey. Um, The book focused mainly on her life and how he turned his tragedy into a positive force. The book is available on Amazon right now for Kindle for 99 cents. And it's called She Had No Enemies. Emily Miller, the 16-month-old, that was the toddler. She was found with her mother, Tracy Miller. Mm -hmm. Remember the one in Manhattan, Mm -hmm. Kansas? She is a member of Missourians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty. And Mm -hmm. she's spoken at the Missouri State Capitol wanting to put a moratorium on the death penalty. And there is a piece that she wrote on missourycatholic.org that I'll link in the show notes. And it's very interesting to read. She's like totally against the death penalty. Doesn't believe, to my knowledge, that Lorette should have been put to death due to his mental history. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, that's the serial killer that you've never heard of that was found right down the street from us. I had no idea. Never heard of him. Shocked. Hmm. 
Wow. Wow. I mean, yeah. I'm not, I don't know about the death penalty. Some cases I totally, yeah, let's do it. And then other cases, when you think about how many people that are innocent that are on death row, mm -hmm. it's pretty scary. Like, well, so I, I kind of flip flop on it. Yeah. And it's a little interesting with the brain damage that he had. And then obviously right. he had some learning disabilities, which could indicate other brain damage when he was younger. Right. So so do we put to death people that aren't? But then also you have to go back at that and look. But he, you know, what he, he did. Gotta, I know. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, what's life right. in you prison is to me, life in prison is worse. And I think honestly, I think it costs more to put a person to death than it does. From what I remember reading about this, it costs more to execute a person than to keep him in prison for life. You are correct. That is mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. And people don't realize mostly it's because of the taxpayer money that goes into the appeal system and right. the years to keep them, you know, right. sometimes it's 25 years, 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. you're still in prison. Right. Death row, then you have to have more, you know, more officers on the unit because it's only one to a cell. Mm -hmm. So there's many factors, but yes, it does. Yeah. So anyway, he was creepy and he would just come into your house. I That's guess scary. he would see you and kind of stalk you as you came into a home and, yeah, follow you in. And then just leave the babies. That's weird, too. Yeah. And then also, like, he picked the judge's wife, was it? And then there was another one that was, was it a police officer's girlfriend? No, wife? it was the woman whose family was big into greyhounds and dog racing. No, it was another one, though, because it stuck in, out in my head that I was like, huh, it's kind of nervy. Oh, I, forgot I don't think I don't think he really... No, I know, but that's cared. that's what I was thinking. See, but then he didn't. It didn't matter. No, which is he even just scarier. saw them and took a shining to him, <laughs> and then followed him home. And um, crime of opportunity, which yeah. is hard to solve. Exactly. But yeah, if it wasn't for those three factors, having the two witnesses, and then Robertson calling to get his car cleaned up, because he, I mean, <laughs> he knew that they'd blame him because he had a history. Yeah, but wouldn't it be better just to call and be like, listen, would. I had a friend here. I think here's my car. Yeah. Figured yeah. out. Yeah. I think he used my car to commit a crime. What yeah. do I do? But people panic, I guess, and just, it's I don't know. It's weird. It's they weird. Don't, they don't do the right thing. But yes, like I said, when you come home, first thing you do is just lock the door. You don't I keep don't. it open. You need to start doing that. I know. I'm terrible about it. It's horrible. There's a video where two girls walk into a home or two women walk into a home and on it's on their ring cam. And this guy is like maybe 20 feet behind him and he walked to the door and tries to open it. Did they and he's it? right on. Yeah. He, and she's like, why are you on my porch? Get off. There's a man on my porch. There's a man on my porch. Yeah. But he was like 20 feet behind him. They had no clue. They came in at like two o'clock in the morning and he was That's just so going to walk in right behind him. So scary. They weren't paying attention to their surroundings, but they did lock the door right behind them, which is mm -mm -mm. always what you do. Always lock the door immediately when you get in the car, too. That I do. I Simple think. No, steps. It's automatic, but yeah. All right. Well, good job, Jen Jen. He's creepy. Terrible person. Mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, one step closer to, to uh, Atlanta. Atlanta. Let me finish a thought for you. So anyway, we're getting closer on December 3rd. Cam and I will be live with a bunch of other podcasts you might have heard from, but we will be doing a live at Pinkies Up Beer and Wine on in Roswell, Georgia. Roswell, Georgia. We've got some... Not New Mexico. No, we've got our buddy Brandon from Southern Gothic who is going to be there. Bob Mata from Defense Diaries. The lovely Nina from Already Gone. There's Jason from Santa Land Diaries. Our besties, Lindsay and Jen from Corpus Delecti. Javier from Pretend. Kristen from Murder, She Told. Lainey from True Crime Cases with Lainey. Eric from True Consequences. And Melissa and Leanne from Cults, Crimes, and Cabernet. It's going to be a good time. So make sure you come see us. Yep. Yeah. December 3rd. Super exciting. Seven, seven to ten. There is limited seating. So if you are anywhere close to Roswell, Georgia, please come. Uh, I will, will have email us at our true because I don't have the information on where you buy tickets, but you're going to need tickets. But it's at Pinkies yeah. Up 
Beer and Wine in Roswell, Georgia, on Crossville Road. All Sorry, right, Jen. Hey, uh, this uh, uh, message seems ever so important after what you shared. But mm-hmm. remember, lock your doors. As soon as you get in the house, you lock those doors. And you also keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye-bye. Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Jen. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at wetalkofdreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from Octoberpod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash our true crime podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya.